do I ever start? Uh, air buttons. Air buttons. Ah, all right. You are an ant on a surface. How do you plead an introduction to algebraic topology? <laughs> Hello, my name is Paul McNutt. Hi, I'm Paul. Okay. So, you are an ant. <laughs> if you are not an ant, then you are one now for the sake of argument or of bad karma in a previous life. <laughs> You're just minding your daily business, mindlessly seeking out sugar, slavishly serving the queen, when suddenly a local miscreant apprehends you and imprisons you upon a surface. Improbable, you say? No, very probable indeed. According to increased intelligence, decreased ownership of magnifying glasses reported by local miscreants, Topeka's son, Boyce, Jun, 27, 2008. It's just the people are doing these days. So with nowhere else to go, you might still examine your world in prison. It could be a sphere, or a donut shape, a Klein bottle, or far stranger things. Uh, this, is, this is the projective plane, also known as boys' surface. Uh, it's called that for its uh, predilection for boys. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is that as an ant, you have several limitations. For instance, you can't see very far. Uh, you can't fly. You're not one of those flying ants. <laughs> And you have no religion, thus no contact with the divine. In short, you have no way to gain a god's eye or flying inside you on the world that you live in. So how on earth are you going to answer the question, what kind of surface am I on? <laughs> <laughs> but you see, answering this question is a great responsibility, and with great responsibility comes great power. <laughs> and in particular, the one power that all ants hold secret, the power of magic marker light. <laughs> Um, and hopefully this power can help you overcome those limitations just mentioned. So you begin to draw. You draw a sort of graph type design on your surface. Uh, the lines in green there are called edges, the red points where they meet are called vertices, and the blue areas in between are called faces. Now if these, if these names aren't similar from geometry, they are hopefully, they are hopefully familiar from uh, being good names for, for new wave bands from the early 80s. <laughs> um, and, so, and, and you, you can more or less, you, you can do this however you want. Um, the one caveat is that, is that your faces often be more, more or less sheets. They can't have holes in the middle of them. Um, and while it's not a problem on a sphere, it is a problem on, say, a donut shape. You can't put the donut hole inside an entire face. Uh, so this is supposed to represent one of these graphs drawn in a sphere. Um, there's a large blue face behind representing the, the rest of the sphere that you can't see because it's hidden from you by, by perspective. Um, <laughs> and so let's count. Who can tell me how many vertices there are there? Seven. Seven. Eight. 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 There are eight vertices. Correct. Who can tell me how many edges there are? Thirteen. Thirteen. You, not you. Who can tell me how many faces there are? Seven. No. Seven. Okay, yeah, seven. Um, <laughs> and, so, and, and now we make a simple calculation. Uh, this is something called, it's called the Euler characteristic. Uh, it's written with the Greek letter chi, but I prefer to think of it as an X that's let as freak flag fly. <laughs> X as, as vertices minus, uh, I should have fixed that, vertices minus edges plus faces. So that should be 8 minus 13 plus 7, which is 2. <laughs> And you can immediately realize that there are certain things that you can do that don't affect Fuji X. For instance, you can you can swiggly, you can have as much swiggling as you want. Um, that's not going to change the number of edges, vertices, or faces. It'll only change their shape. So Fuji X will remain the same. Likewise, if the local miscreant decides to bend the surface by running it over with his trike, um, <laughs> Fuji X will change because your graph will remain intact. Uh, that's why they're called magic marker legs. Um, so, so here we started with void surface on the lower right, and we changed it into a surface that has the same value of freaky x, but no longer has a predilection for boys. Hooray for mathematics! <laughs> and, and this can even include adding corners to it. So for our purposes, a sphere, a cube, a cone, a pyramid, they're all the same. Uh, our methods can't and won't distinguish between them. But you'll never notice, because you're an ant. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are also some things that that don't affect free PX, but it's a little more difficult to realize that they don't affect free PX. For instance, you can add a new vertex and a new edge connecting it to an old vertex. That increases the number of vertices by one, and it increases the number of edges by one, so free PX remains the same. Likewise, if you start with two vertices that aren't connected, you can connect them um, by adding a new edge between them. This splits that one face in two, and it adds one more edge, so again, free PX remains the same. And 
if you think about it, these are the only two things you can do when you're drawing your graph. So no matter what graph you draw, you'll always calculate the same value. Hooray. <laughs> He's happy because his math worked. <laughs> so for example, these are the platonic solids, but as I said, for our, for our purposes, they're all spheres, and they have these graphs built into them, namely they're the vertices and edges that are already there. Um, and you know, if we make any of these calculations, we get the same value for dx2. For dx of a sphere is 2. Um, and if you're still skeptical, you can do this at home on a balloon. Just draw any graph and calculate for dx, and you're looking at 2. If you don't have any balloons, I suggest that you be patient and wait until your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, um, freaky x of void surface is 1. Freaky x of a donut is 0. But oh no, problem. Uh, freaky x of <laughs> are both 0. So in this case, we can't distinguish between them, even though, even though they are obviously different. Um, and so we need to think of it different. We need to think of it deeper, I mean. How are they obviously different? Well, both of them have two sorts of holes. Uh, on the donut, you have a hole in the middle, but you also have a big hole on the inside because it's like a, a circle that goes around another circle. Um, a Klein bubble works more or less the same way, but, but in this case, the holes seem different. Again, there's this, there's this one circle that goes around the bottle longitudinally, and there's another one where you, you make a loop by starting with that big funnel, going inside, and going back up. Uh, sorry, I hope that wasn't too confusing. Um, <laughs> but, but the thing is, what we need is a system for, for labeling and counting our holes. And again, we can do this using our old graph. Um, it's more or less three steps. First, we look for cycles in our graph when we give them names. Uh, so that big square in the middle could be called Bob. Um, the triangle in the upper left could be called Saintus Bernardette. And, and, and the loop you get by going all the way around the graph, that could be called Zarathustra. <laughs> um, and, and, and moreover, we want to be able to add and subtract them. Um, so, you know, we could start out by taking two times Bob, and then add three times Zarathustra, and then subtract a single Stevie, and, and that would count as a, a cycle for our purposes. Um, and, and, and finally, we want to say that the two of them are the same if, if together they bound some face or sum of faces. So in particular, a cycle is zero if it itself bounds a face. So in this case, um, all of those cycles are zero, so, so, so Bob and the others, uh, they're nothing to us. Um, we, we should bury them now and move on. Uh, so, so here's a graph I've drawn on a donut, and these two cycles aren't zero. I've named them Zeb and Mort. Um, <laughs> And, and we can see, we can not only see that, they, that they're not zero, but we can also see that they're, they're different from each other. Um, and the way we do this is we take that, that single big face that connects both Zeb and Mort, and we figure out what its boundary is. Um, one way to do this is by imagining that you start out with a figure eight shape made of just Zeb and Mort, and you attach the face to it as this, as this sheet. So here's how we can do that. Um, try to imagine this if you can, it's okay if you can. Uh, we, we first go all the way around Zeb, forwards, then we go all the way around Mort forwards, then we go backwards around Zeb and backwards around Mort. And so the boundary is Zeb plus Mort minus Zeb minus Mort, which is of course zero. So in other words, Zeb and Mort aren't equal, no multiple of Zeb is equal to any multiple of Mort, so in this case we're good. So now let's look at, at a Klein bottle. Uh, again, I have a graph with one vertex, one face, and, and two cycles named Lossy and Snag. <laughs> But now, here's what we do in order to attach the face of the Klein bottle to the two edges. We go around snag once, then around lossy once, but then we go around snag the same way and go around lossy backwards. So its boundary is two times snag, which means that two times snag equals zero, even though snag itself is non-zero. Um, and if this seems confusing to you, here's another way to think about it. You can move snag all the way around the bottle, up to the funnel up top, and then back to its original position. But then when you get there, its direction will be reversed. Snag will change it to minus snag. So snag and minus snag have to be the same, which means that 2 times snag equals 0. And so now I come to the only fancy word I've really used in this presentation. This is called the first homology group, or H1. Um, okay, I, I didn't know if there was an, a sign language word for homology, but uh, I, I guess there isn't. Um, so, so, so H1 like seven sphere, as we saw, is equal to 0, because Bob, Zara, Fustra, etc., they were all equal to 0. H1 the torus is all the multiples of z plus all the multiples of more. Those angle brackets just mean z, 2 times z, minus z, etc. Um, and h1 of the Klein bottle is lossy plus snag, but, but I've written divided by 2 times snag because, because 2 times snag here is equal to 0. And so we've used homology to prove that the torus and the Klein bottle are different. Um, 
And, and so this is useful because obviously it's a better distinguisher for surfaces than, than freaky x, but it, it's, it actually distinguishes any two surfaces. Um, likewise, it gives you names and descriptions of the various holes in the surface, so you can tell when a hole looks more like a lozzy and when it looks more like a snag in some arbitrary surface. Um, and, and in particular, snag and lozzy are different sorts of holes. They mustn't be allowed to mix, it would be unseemly. <laughs> story is in fact an allegory because we are the ants and God is our local miscreant. Huh? Instead of imprisoning us on a surface, he's imprisoned us in a three-dimensional universe. But, but maybe with the power of homology and our magic marker legs, <laughs> we can find out what shape that universe is, both on the, on the very large and on the inter, intraparticular scales. <laughs> uh, so, so ladies and gentlemen, let us begin to draw. Uh, thanks to Peter Davis, Professor Mike Hopkins, Alan Hatcher, and myself. <laughs>